Peace and love. This is Penelope. I'm putting this little preface on the beginning of the reading of this book, uh, William Penn's Holy Experiment. And I'm going to start the book uh, with the second chapter because it's more about William Penn than the first chapter. Uh, the first chapter is great. But um, I'm going to read that after, and I think you'll understand why. You'll 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 get more clarity. Anyway, um, I recommend that you also buy the book and follow along with me when we're doing this. Uh, the next two videos coming up are in about fifteen to sixteen minute segments. And there's two. So the entire video is just a little bit over a half an hour. And this is part one of chapter two. Okay. So I hope you enjoy it. Peace and love. Holler at me and let me know what you think. Chapter two. Planting Pennsylvania. 1682 to 1718, William Penn's governance of, quote, unquote, my country. Penn comes into his province for the first of two periods, 1682, between 1682 to 1684. Harrison and Pemberton settle their new lives. When a pen arrived as one of his new colony's first English settlers on October 28, 1682, separated from his beloved wife and children at home in England and now beyond the seas, he had spent two months crossing. He found himself coming into a land that was unknown to him. He arrived not only as one of the Delaware Valley's first English settlers, but as his sole proprietor and governor. He had known of this region intellectually, having written promotional sales literature for West Jersey and his own plantation of Pennsylvania. But this merely intellectual understanding could not prepare him for the challenges and problems lying ahead. To order a quiet and peaceable plantation, before leaving the welcome at Newcastle, Penn called aboard the commissioner's station there by the governor of New York, who, under James, Duke of New York, had authority over this colony of Delaware, so critically situated on the west side of the lower Delaware River and on the western shore of the of the Delaware Bay, south of its opening onto the Atlantic Ocean and extending even farther down the seacoast for several miles. The first Europeans to enter the Delaware area were the Dutch traders, who came about 1615. Subsequently, the, du the Dutch attempted to plant and attempted to plant and the Lenapes soon uprooted an agricultural settlement in 1631. One year before Charles I's patent for Maryland was granted to Lord Baltimore. By the time of Penn's arrival, Swedish, Finnish, and English, as well as Dutch settlers, were living in the Delaware colony. Because of the critical need, to provide free access to this to the sea for his plantation in, in Pennsylvania, Penn had worked for more than a year in England to secure his legal position in these Delaware waters. He began receiving the fruits of his labors only shortly before his departure for America on August 24th. The most illustrious prince, his royal highness, James Duke of York and Albany, Earl of Ulster and, and Company, 
executed four instruments conveying his interest in the Delaware colony. And it sees, and it sees access to Penn. And it's C access to Penn. He conveyed two deeds of title, one for Newcastle and the 12 mile circle area and the other for the area south of it. And also two leases for 10,000 years, one each for the same areas, possibly given in case the Duke's right to convey land granted to him in 1664 by Charles II was disputed. Such a dispute was certain to be raised by Lord Baltimore, who claimed that the area was included within the boundaries described in the Maryland Charter of 1632. Even though that charter excluded lands occupied by the Europeans. When the commissioners were received aboard the welcome, Penn presented the two deeds for their ex examination. The report written years later by John Moll, being then left the first in commission by Sir Edmund Andros, Governor General under His Royal Highness. James Duke of York, recited that the commissioners, after a period of study, had unanimously agreed to comply with the Duke's orders and did give and surrender in the name of His Royal Highness, actual and peaceable possession of the fort at Newcastle. By giving Penn the key to the fort, some turf with a twig in it, and a small bowl of river water. A few days later, the ritual was repeated further south to symbolize the conveyance to Penn of the two lower counties of Kent and Sussex as well. The response in the colony to these conveyances was so positive that in early December, when the Pennsylvania Assembly held its first meeting at Chester, Freeholders of the three lower counties comprising Delaware petitioned for an act of union and their incorporation in and with the province of Pennsylvania in order to their enjoyment of all the rights and privileges of the aforesaid province and that they might be forever esteemed and accounted as free men of the before named province. Penn and the assembly granted the petition. Before leaving England, Penn had also worked to acquire the eastern shores of the lower Delaware River and of the Delaware Bay down to the Atlantic. This was completed in September by the purchase, made through the agency of his attorney in London of the Salem Colony in West Jersey. Penn took possession in, Delaware in December, thereby securing for Pennsylvania the right of unhindered passage to and from the Atlantic over the waters of the Delaware River and Bay. Penn reached his province of Pennsylvania shortly after going ashore at Newcastle in late October, in those first days of actually planting the community, determining the, and bounding the first counties, which were Chester, Philadelphia, and Bucks, ordering the administration of all governments and choosing their administrators, selecting the site for, for, for Philadelphia, the provincial capital, and planning its construction allotting land to and meeting the concerns of the first purchasers of Pennsylvania. The task already begun in England would now seem myriad and the time for execution all too finite. Penn began with some 
able assistants, but had to make quick decisions as he rec recruited more counselors and entrusted his enterprise to others, many of whom, other than being friends, were strangers to him. He gave one of the earliest commissions to his cousin, William Markham, of 1635 to 1704. Whom William Penn, whom Penn appointed, even though he was not a Quaker, his deputy governor in April 1681, a month after receiving the charter. Markham had left England for New York, where the acting governor there gave him a proclamation ordering the people of Pennsylvania to transfer their allegiance to Penn. Penn soon proceeded from Newcastle to Chester, arriving by August the 3rd. As directed, Markham had selected a provincial council of nine members over which he presided, and this council undertook the initial work of determining boundaries with neighboring provinces, surveying, creating courts and appointing lesser officials, and enacting ordin ordinances for preserving peace and safety. Penn gave another commission of critical importance one year later in April 1682 to Thomas Holmes, 1624 to 1695. A year later in April 1682, to Tom, oh, I'm sorry, a friend, forgive me, Penn gave another commission of critical importance one year later in April 1682 to Thomas Holm, a friend and first purchaser. Holm became surveyor general of Pennsylvania, in which office Penn confirmed him for life in 1688. Holmes' achievement over the years is attested in his plan of Philadelphia and map of Pennsylvania. Although Penn did not leave a journal of his time during these early months in America, some of his activities can be reconstructed, reconstructed from other sources. On November 21, 1682, he was in New York. Where I last, and this quote, quoting Penn, where I last night persuaded all parties to let fall their animosities, which they promised. According to his letter of that date, to the Secretary of the Lords of Trade and to a clerk of the Privy and Council, Privy Council in London. The parties referred to were local officials in the Duke of York's government. Penn was undoubtedly serving the interests of his friend, the Duke, as well as introducing himself on a neighborly political visit. From December 4th to 7th, he was known to be engaged at Upland, which Penn about this time renamed Chester. Meeting with the duly elected representatives of the General Assembly of the Province of Pennsylvania, along with representatives of the adjacent lower counties of Delaware, recently purchased by Penn from the Duke of York. There he met a major disappointment. The refusal of the Assembly, of the assembly to ratify his frame of government his draft constitution for Pennsylvania without modifications. He had noted a concern over the, poss over the possibility of just such interference or obstruction in his preference to the frame issued in the previous April in England, writing that it was, oh my God, okay, wait. He had noted a concern over the possibility of just of, of just such interference or obstruction in his preference to the frame issued 
the previous April in England, writing that it was, quote, unquote, uneasy for me, uneasy to me to think of publishing the ensuing frame and conditional laws for seeing both the censures they will meet from men of different differing humors and engagements and the and the occasion they may give of discourse by not my by my design oh goodness it would not be until april 2nd 1683 that the changes were agreed upon and the second frame of the government became pennsylvania's first working constitution the assembly also dealt Penn a major defeat by refusing to confirm the charter for the Free Society of Traders, Free Society of Traders, in Pennsylvania, which he had granted March twenty fourth, sixteen eighty two. This was an enterprise intended to promote and exploit the province's economic potential and resources and to build its markets. Quaker merchants in England invested in this corporation of venture capitalists and received from Penn the use of 20,000 acres known as the Manor of Frank, along with certain rights, including that of holding their own independent court. This was a this was an anachronistic echo of feudal times. But the assembly would would not then or ever confirm the charter, and the project eventually collapsed. I will continue reading chapter two of William Penn's Holy Experiment, Planting, Pennsylvania, 1682, shortly. All right, I'm back. I hope you enjoyed the first part of the second chapter of this book, William Penn's Holy Experiment. Um, I was reading practically all night. Uh, doing that first part, so, uh, you know, I think I sound a little bit sleepy and all of that kind of stuff. Anyway, fully awake now, about to pick up where I left off, um, specifically uh, where the project had collapsed because of William Penn's absence. Continuing with the Holy Experiment, William Penn's Holy Experiment. Between December 11th and 13th, Penn met with Charles Calvert, the third Lord Baltimore, the third Lord Baltimore, in an attempt to resolve the newly discovered problem of determining the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. This was but the beginning of his search for a solution to this vexing issue that would, in its course, compel Penn to make his first return to England to serve his colonists in Pennsylvania and Delaware for decades and keep land titles in a state of uncertainty until almost the eve of the Revolutionary War, when the Mason-Dixon survey settled the matter. Meanwhile, the Harrison and Pemberton families were facing their own challenges as they crossed the Atlantic to the New World, arriving not in the province of Pennsylvania on or near the Delaware River as intended, but in Lord Baltimore's Chester. I'm sorry, but at in Lord Baltimore's Maryland, at Chop Tank, on the eastern shore of Chesapeake Bay. The voyage had begun on September 5th. It ended on October 30th. In his log, the captain of their ship, the Submission, out of Liverpool, noted the three days when the vessel was becalmed some days of very cold and some of extraordinary hot weather, as well as two great storms, one of which caused considerable damage to the lifeboat, main hatches, and rudder. 
the travelers experienced the joys of whale and porpoise sightings and the grief over the death on the day of the most punishing storm of a 10-year-old boy, a passenger who died for reasons not given. Most inexplicable was the failure of the captain to record in the log the last nine days of the crossing, leading one commentator to observe. As Captain Settle was bound for another port, and the weather being overcast, it is highly probable that upon the 21st day of the seventh month, October, he did not know where he was and therefore did not complete the log. The Pembertons later attributed the great inconvenience of being put ashore in Maryland rather than in Pennsylvania to the captain's dishonesty, inasmuch as he had been paid 4.5 shillings for each of them, except for two children who were charged half fares, as well as 30 shillings per ton for their possessions to take them to Delaware River or elsewhere in Pennsylvania to the best conveniency of freighters. The entire Harrison Pemberton party consisted of 13 souls, James Harrison, Anne, his wife, Agnes, his mother, the Harrison servants, Alice Dickerson and Jane Lyon, Robert Bond, Harrison's ward, Phoebe Pemberton, the Harrison's daughter, Phineas Pemberton, Phoebe's husband, with their children, Abigail, Joseph, Ralph Pemberton, and Phineas's father, and the Pemberton servants, Joseph Mather and Elizabeth Bradley. Harrison and Pemberton arranged for the care of the others in their party with the local community of friends that had been forming since the 1650s and had been visited by George Fox in 1672 and 1673. They then proceeded overland to their original destination, the falls of the Delaware River above the future site of Philadelphia in what would become Bucks County. On the way, they stopped in Newcastle to confer with Penn, only to find that he had left. Some said for New York, next stopping in the wilderness of what was then of what then was Philadelphia. Their horses disappeared for some days, compelling them to finish the journey up the Delaware by boat. Upon their arrival at the falls, Harrison and Pemberton were reunited with Harrison's brother-in-law, William Yardley, who had preceded them by several weeks and was already constructing his home. Harrison and Pemberton, Pemberton each chose a site for their new family estates. Pemberton's selection was noted in the Pemberton family annals, although not in Penn's land records. All these P's <coughs> are uh, near the same spot on the banks of the Delaware opposite Orclans Island, Phineas determined to settle and purchased a tract of 300 acres of land, which he named Grove Place. Harrison, a first purchaser by his April 1682 investment in 5,000 acres in Bucks County, entitling him also to a lot in Philadelphia, chose property on the main river called Sea Pass. Penn refers to this in his own last will and testament of August 1684, made before his return to England, but the annals of the Pemberton family are silent on this estate. Having resolved where their families would reside, Harrison and Pemberton set out to rejoin their families in Maryland. Public duty, however, intervened and Harrison went upland, went to Upland or Chester for the first meeting of the Provincial General Assembly held December 4 through 7. The official records are incomplete for this session, but the Pemberton Annals state that Harrison was chosen a member of the Assembly, which seems likely, and Speaker of the House of Provincial Representatives, which does not. By April or May 1683, the two families had 
at last completed their move to Pennsylvania. Even then, the Pembertons were guests in the home of Lionel Britton until their own house at Grove Place was built. Lionel Britton. Keep that name in your mind. We're going to get back to that stuff. On May, May 2nd, 1683, these newly arrived friends joined with others of their religious society, already residing in the Falls area in organizing a already residing in the Falls area. He joined with friends, <laughs> others of their religious society already residing in the Falls area in organizing a monthly meeting and made this minute of their formal decision. At a meeting at William Biles' house on the second day of the third month of May, 1683, then held to wait upon the Lord for his wisdom to hear what should be offered. In order to inspect into the affairs of the church that all things may be kept there in sweet and savory to the Lord, and by our care over the church, helpful in the work of God. And we, whose names are as follows, being then present, thought it fit and necessary that a monthly meeting should be set up, both men and women, for that purpose, and that this meeting to be the first of the men's meeting after our arrival into these parts. The friends present, William Yardley, James Harrison, Phineas Pemberton, William Biles, William Dark, Lionel Brittany, William Beeks. Lots of Williams. Also in 1683, Pemberton, aged 33 years, and with experience as a gross, grocer in Bolton, Lancashire, began receiving requests to enter public service. The first came from Penn's Provincial Register General, Christopher Taylor, who appointed Pemberton to be his deputy as register for Bucks County. The Provincial Enrollment Office or Registry as described in the proprietor's laws agreed upon in England was charged with re registering all forms of land conveyances, whether executed within or without the province, all promissory, all promissory instruments above five pounds and not under three months, and the names, time, wages, and days of payment for all servants. That same year, Penn appointed Pemberton as clerk of the court in Bucks County. The laws agreed upon in England also mandated a separate enrollment distinct from the other registry for births, marriages, burials, wills, and letters of administration. And in 1684, Pemberton was appointed by Taylor as the Register of Wills for Bucks County. On February 20th, that same year, Phineas, Phineas' son, Israel, was born. In these first appointments to new offices in a new government in a new province, a major challenge would have been to devise and put in place the filing systems and registry books necessary to affect the orderly function of the audit of the office. Pemberton's initial success was attested by his later commissions as the deputy master of the rolls in 1686, receiver of proprietary quatrents in 1689, registrar general 1691, and master of the rolls in 1696 all in Bucks County. In 1683, between March 10th and April 4th, James Harrison was fully engaged at Philadelphia with the Provincial Council in his proceedings with the General Assembly to resolve their differences over the organic law of the province. Organic law. The first frame of the government had been written by Penn and then signed solely by him in London on April 25th, 1682. However, the General Assembly at its first meeting the following December at Chester 
had declined to approve it without major changes. At the March-April 1683 meeting in Philadelphia, meant to resolve the disagreements, Penn, as proprietor and governor, presided over the council, of which Harrison was now one of its 16 elected members. The most significant changes made in the frame were to enlarge its extent beyond the province of Pennsylvania to the three lower counties on the Delaware called the territories thereunto annexed, and to reduce the size of the council from 72 to 18 members and of the assembly from 200 to 36. The membership to be proportionately increased with population growth up to the limits of 72 in the council and 200 in the assembly. But not until 1701 would Penn concede the right of the assembly to initiate legislation. In all these proceedings and negotiations, Harrison took an active part, serving on council committees, conveying the position of the council to the assembly, conferring with the assembly on behalf of the council, and with four other councillors preparing by eight o'clock of by by eight of the clock tomorrow morning, the second frame of the government of the province of Pennsylvania in America, also referred to internally as this council, I'm sorry, this present charter of liberties. Penn, 12 members of the council, including Harrison, the governor's secretary and council's clerk, 21 members of the assembly, and its clerk and four inhabitants of Philadelphia present signed on April 2nd, 1683, the governing document for the province and the territories there unto annexed. Woo. <sighs> Appointing agents to manage the proprietor's affairs in Pennsylvania as Penn prepares for an early return to England. During the long week spent guiding the second frame to completion and final adoption, Penn had the opportunity to closely observe the talents of his associates, talents he would need to draw on for assistance in the many challenges lying ahead. He soon commissioned Har Harrison, aged 55 years, and experienced as a shoemaker and shopkeeper in Bolton, Lancashire to serve with various other council members on three missions, all concerned with Penn's two persistent southern boundary problems with Lord Baltimore, with the third Lord Baltimore. There were many Lord Baltimores, I guess the Lord, whoever the Lord of Baltimore, who was just called the Lord of Baltimore, they didn't say his name. Yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, and number two, the location of the 40th degree of latitude. Years after these issues were finally resolved, historian Walter B. Scaff described these two disputes. 